Over the course of this series, we have looked at every playable character in Final Fantasy VII, except one. And so today, it is finally time to take an in-depth look at Cla- <laughs> hold, hold on, just one Hello? Hey. Uh-huh. Death of Humanity? Giant Meteor? Okay. Alright, All right. bye. So we're going to be taking a look at Sephiroth. Sephiroth, the ultimate Shinra soldier tragically fallen from grace, a mad scientist's perfect experiment, a self-proclaimed deity, and one of the most famous video game villains of all time. Sephiroth's legendary status transcends even the Final Fantasy series, as over the years he has become an icon of video game bad guys. His legacy stems from the masterful telling of his story, originally revealed to the player as a legendary soldier and revealing his tragic fall through a retelling that the player is able to play through themselves. The player isn't just told that Sephiroth is strong, they are shown it in real time. They aren't just told that Sephiroth lost his mind, they experience all of the events leading up to it. The player is shown Sephiroth's motivations, thoughts, and power, and then it gets personal. The perfect mixture of storytelling, character design, memorable scenes, and attacks, and one of the greatest musical themes of all time cemented Sephiroth as one of the best antagonists ever created. Usually in these videos, I begin the timeline of events with some biographical information of the character we're discussing, but uh, there's not much, and that's by design. Part of Sephiroth's story is the cover-up of his past. Shinra was sure to cover up all details of his childhood in order to conceal his true origin. So Square decided to bring this into the real world by covering up all of his biographical information in the game's manuals and later informational publications. In the Japanese game manual, they basically cover up all information on him. In the North American version, they still only mention his ranking and his weapon as a longsword but they also list his height as 6'1". That's... a bit strange. Seems like in any of the newer Final Fantasy VII content, Sephiroth is quite a bit taller than 6 feet. Now, they may have changed his height in the Final Fantasy VII Remake because it's a remake, but even in Advent Children, he seems more than 4 inches taller than Cloud. In later publications, like the Ultimania Omega, his height is again listed as unknown. So, was this just something added randomly by somebody in the localization team, or is this actually accurate? In the original game, it is really difficult to tell because of the perspective of the fields, as well as certain places where certain models are larger than normal to compensate for them being closer or further away from our point of view. Unfortunately, the only way we could look into this further would be to extract the actual models from the game files, and compare them side by side in a model viewer, which would be a ton of work just to determine the accuracy of this one piece of information, which has been changed in every publication since. So I went and extracted all of the models from the game files and compared them side by side in a model viewer, and the results are... complicated. If I had to guess, the localization team took this information from the standing field models. As you can see, Barrett is just slightly taller than Sephiroth. The battle models are a bit different. Both the normal Sephiroth battle model and the final battle Sephiroth model seem taller than Barrett's model, but as you can see, Barrett has a certain, uh, grace during battle, standing in a perpetual half-squat position. 
So, it seems somebody in the localization looked at the standing models and just said, Eh, looks like 6-1. The only other piece of official biographical information that can be found on Sephiroth is in the Final Fantasy Ultimania archive, in which his birthplace is labeled as Nibelheim. Sephiroth's birth itself is a bit complicated as well. We know he is roughly 25 years old during Crisis Core and 27 years old during Final Fantasy VII, which places his birth date sometime around 1980. Professor Hojo and Professor Gast were working on the Genova Project at the time, a research project on an alien entity known as Genova. At this point in time, Gast and Hojo thought that Genova was a Cetra, the ancient race tasked with protecting the planet. But in reality, Genova was the calamity of the sky which nearly caused the extinction of the Cetra. Hojo, in an attempt to understand Genova better, infused Genova's cells into his own unborn baby, currently in the womb of Lucrezia Crescent, an assistant to Vincent's father, but later placed on the Genova project alongside Hojo and Gast. The injection of Genova cells into the unborn Sephiroth caused Lucrezia extreme pain as well as gave her visions of future atrocities that Sephiroth would commit. When Sephiroth was born, he was immediately seized by Shinra, never giving Lucrezia a chance to hold him. This is probably the reason why Sephiroth doesn't have a last name. His name is just Sephiroth. But even if we were to give him a last name, we still wouldn't know what it is, because it has never been confirmed if Professor Hojo's first or last name is Hojo. Professor Gast used his first name for his title, so did Hojo as well? Or does he have some mysterious first name? Maybe it's Joe. Joe Hojo. Anyway, it seems that the scientists at Shinra expected Sephiroth to be able to talk to the planet, as they still thought that Genova was a Cetra. But as they realized that he didn't have the capability, they shifted into creating him into the ultimate super soldier. Due to the success of this plan, the soldier program was started officially, and scientists began infusing ordinary Shinra soldiers in the same way, but with Mako instead of Genova cells. Oh, uh, sorry about that. That's just my retcon alarm. Yeah, unfortunately, Soldier being created in this way doesn't really make sense in the compilation of Final Fantasy VII, or in other words, everything that came after the original game. The biggest issue is the Ultimania Omega, which states that Sephiroth was the first Soldier, but also states that Soldier existed before the Genova Project. Also, it isn't clear if the whole Soldier idea came from Project S, which led to Sephiroth and the Sephiroth clones, or Project G, which led to Genesis and Angeal, or even the Deep Ground crew, who were also empowered by Mako. The most likely scenario is that Square really liked the idea of Sephiroth being the first soldier, but then they decided that they wanted really cool soldier dudes and Dirge of Cerberus, so they just kind of threw that idea out the window. Also, just because Square loves to complicate things, they released a Battle Royale title in 2021, which takes place eight years after Sephiroth was born, and what do they call it? Final Fantasy VII, The First Soldier. I have no idea why it's called this. Sephiroth is even in the game, but he's obviously not eight years old. I know, I know, it's a Battle Royale, the story isn't supposed to be taken seriously, and they just want to throw in stuff like this to make the game fun. But apparently, you play as the first official soldier candidates for the Shinra military. So why not call it the first soldiers, or soldier origins? You can throw in all the goofy stuff into the gameplay, but it would be nice if at least the main concept and name of the game fit the continuity. I mean, are you trying to tell me that the first ever soldier was this guy? Anyways, in the end, we can just say that Sephiroth was the first Genova cell infused soldier, and the very first Mako infused soldier is just unknown. Sephiroth was never told of his true origins or of his real mother, being told instead that his mother was a woman named Genova. It is told that Sephiroth has a hard time fitting in as he grew up, always feeling different but having no knowledge of the experiments that created him. Sephiroth would also grow a fondness for Professor Gast while denouncing Professor Hojo. As the soldier program progressed, Sephiroth would become Shinra's most legendary member. He would surpass all other soldiers and reach such an acclaimed status that Shinra would begin using him as a tool to spread propaganda and bring new recruits into the program. 
Sephiroth himself is a fascinating character at this time, and every interaction that he's in gives us a glimpse into his true personality. Being an outcast growing up, he leans into his strength as a soldier, but has this sense of calmness and even empathy about him. Multiple times it is revealed that Sephiroth cares for his friends. It seems that because it was so hard for him to make friends growing up, the few friends that he does have and can relate to within the soldier ranks mean a great deal to him. He often spars with them to help them improve their skills, and when he injures Genesis during a one-on-one -on -one match, he even offers a blood transfusion to help the wound heal. When Genesis and Angeal turn traitor on Shinra, instead of inciting revenge, Sephiroth is genuinely hurt and refuses missions involving the two as he doesn't want to hurt his former friends. His feelings of friendship versus his duty as a soldier even push him to consider quitting soldier altogether. Before he quits though, he is placed on one last mission to Nibelheim to investigate a monster outbreak. He is sent with Zack and three normal infantrymen, one of which is Cloud. One moment that always stuck out to me is when Sephiroth asks Cloud how he feels to be back in his hometown. Sephiroth really does break most norms you would place on his character. You expect him to be this cold professional, but he has enough care for his team to ask a basic infantryman a meaningful question. When the group reaches the reactor, they discover that Hojo had been experimenting with a new form of Mako infusion, using frozen condensed Mako together with a human host to create monsters. The setup for this reveal is really cool by the way, this is the reason they have the party explain how materia is formed just before reaching the reactor. These pods are basically the Mako fountain they found earlier. Hojo thought that if a fountain of Mako could condense and create materia, condensed Mako inside of a human could create something super powerful. Sephiroth makes this same realization, but suddenly questions if he himself was created the same way, instead of with the normal Mako infusions that other soldiers receive. He begins to compare himself to the monsters in the pods, and this is what causes his initial outburst of rage. In the compilation of Final Fantasy VII, specifically Crisis Core, the story is told a bit differently. In Crisis Core, the entire section where Sephiroth talks about condensed Mako and how the humans inside the pods are being combined with materia is completely left out. He instead just simply says Hojo is creating monsters. He then enters the same fit of rage, but is interrupted by Genesis, who reveals to Sephiroth that he was created as part of the Genova Project. Now I do think that this is a better explanation of the events that happen after this, but it is a huge shame that the condensed Mako section was taken out, as it made the scenes prior as well as the initial fit of rage make a bit more sense. Perhaps they wanted to include it but didn't have enough time to recreate the Mako fountain scene, and just felt that it didn't make as much sense without the setup of that scene beforehand. They do include a small snippet of the scene in the DMW, which can go off during battles, so maybe they had thoughts of including the entire scene at some point. After the reactor, Sephiroth returns to Nibelheim and obsessively reads all of the research notes in the library of the Shinra Manor. This is where the Crisis Core events make a bit more sense, as in the original, he just thought that he was made in a different way than the other soldiers, whereas in the Crisis Core telling, he now specifically knows that he was part of the Genova Project. This is where the tragic part of Sephiroth's character hits its ultimate high point. Up until now, Sephiroth had a rough life full of scientists, training, fighting, and a deep desire for friendship. This could have been the moment that Sephiroth realizes the true scope of the Genova Project, that Genova was an alien calamity that nearly destroyed the world, and her cells were used to create him, and it would have been really interesting to know how he would have reacted knowing the actual truth. But as mentioned before, Gast and Hojo initially thought that Genova was a Cetra, and those are the notes that Sephiroth finds in the basement of the old manor. Because of this, Sephiroth decides that the human race must have betrayed the Cetra 2,000 years ago when some type of calamity fell on the planet, which was actually Genova. As tragic as this misinterpretation is, his next decision finally reveals the dark and evil nature of Sephiroth, as he decides that he alone must take vengeance for the Cetra by ridding the world of the entire human race. He leaves the manor and sets fire to the town of Nibelheim, killing many people in the process. He returns to the reactor and after disposing of Tifa's father and Tifa herself, who somehow survives, enters Genova's chamber and takes her head before being stabbed by Cloud. 
he makes his way out of the chamber before being attacked by Cloud again, this time getting the upper hand and stabbing Cloud through his chest. Miraculously, Cloud uses Sephiroth's Mazamune to throw him and Genova's head off of the platform and down to his death. Now, very quickly before we move on, I have to discuss another extremely annoying change in the compilation of Final Fantasy VII, this time in Last Order Final Fantasy VII, a short anime released with the Advent Children movie in Japan. In this animation, Sephiroth stabs Cloud, Cloud does the same thing where he suddenly gets stronger, but then Sephiroth just jumps off the platform himself. After the incident, Shinra pronounces Sephiroth as dead, and rebuilds Nibelheim with Shinra employees posing as villagers in order to cover up the entire event. Usually, when a person dies on the Final Fantasy VII planet, they assimilate into the lifestream and become energy for new life. However, Sephiroth didn't assimilate into the lifestream, and instead was able to travel it freely, gaining all of the knowledge of every inhabitant that ever joined the lifestream, including the Cetra. Most sources that I have found that talk about this simply state that Sephiroth was too powerful or his willpower was too great to assimilate into the lifestream, but I would say that the true reason was because of Genova. Sephiroth is the true reincarnation of Genova, the perfect Genova clone, and given that a huge amount of his body has been created by Genova cells, it would make sense that the planet cannot break him down like a normal human being. The world works in a cycle, it creates life with the power of the life stream, then that life dies and it consumes that same power to create more life. However, Genova is an alien life form, so she wasn't created by the life stream, or at least not this life stream, so it would make sense that the planet can't break Sephiroth down into life stream energy like a normal human. Now if Sephiroth knew this, the stupid retcon in Last Order would make a bit more sense, but at this point, Sephiroth thinks that he and Genova are Cetra, and although he is aware that the Cetra has a promised land that may or may not be in the lifestream, I really doubt he would just jump into the lifestream in hopes that he could somehow use it to his advantage. I'm pretty sure that Sephiroth did not expect this to happen, but when it did and he was thrown into the lifestream, he realized that Genova was not a Cetra, and through the power of the lifestream created a new purpose for himself. Before, he wanted to destroy the human race because he thought they turned on the Cetra. Now, he wants to destroy the human race because that was the true intention of Genova all along. But, you know, just destroying an entire planet isn't good enough for Sephiroth, so he instead hatches an even greater plan. Open up the planet, absorb the entire life stream and all of its power, and become a god. Now, for a really cool side note. Ever see this guy? This is Omega Weapon. That's right, there actually is an Omega Weapon in Final Fantasy VII. But he's in Dirge of Cerberus, which hardly anyone finished. As you probably know already, the weapons were monsters created by the planet to defend it in a time of dire need. However, Omega Weapon was created with a completely different and insane purpose. In the event that the world was completely doomed, and the other weapons had no ability to save it, Omega Weapon would emerge along with its counterpart, Chaos. Yes, that Chaos. Chaos's job is to kill every living thing on the entire planet, so all living energy could return to the life stream. Then Omega Weapon sucks up the life stream, takes off like a giant spaceship, and finds a new planet to begin life anew. Not only is this one of the coolest concepts, but it gives me an idea for a very interesting theory. Is Genova just an Omega weapon from another planet? Was her job to land on the planet and disperse her own version of the life stream, but was successfully thwarted by the Cetra? Is that why she is regarded as a mother? Is that why her cells create life, but when combined with our life stream, it usually ends up in some kind of disaster? Is that why the reunion theory is a thing? How all living things with Genova cells are destined to return to Genova. Is that because of her original purpose, to absorb the power of all the living things on her planet before taking off and finding a new planet? It is explained that Genova basically travels from planet to planet, killing everything and then using the dead planet as a vessel to travel to another planet. So maybe she is just a much more evil version of an Omega weapon, 
almost like Omega Weapon and Chaos combined into one. At any rate, why am I talking about all this? Well, it's because if this were true, or at least somewhat true, this would actually create a really cool connection with Sephiroth's new plan. Up until this point, Sephiroth has Genova cells in him, but we don't really have any proof of him being talked to or coerced into anything by Genova herself. However, once Sephiroth falls into the life stream with Genova's head in his hand, perhaps Genova finally found her way into Sephiroth's mind, telling him the truth about everything and giving him his grand idea. Just as she once traveled from planet to planet, sucking the planet dry of all of its energy and then moving on to the next, what if she gave Sephiroth the idea of absorbing the life stream itself, becoming the new Genova, the new Calamity of the Sky? We can't really prove any of that, but I just like that explanation much better than he traveled the life stream and then just created the idea to blow up the planet. But hey, you can take it or leave it. Back on the surface of the planet, Zack and Cloud are bleeding out on the floor of the Mako reactor, and Dr. Hojo arrives to scoop them up and start a new experiment on them, turning them into Sephiroth clones. Now, as a kid, the term Sephiroth clone always confused me. When you use the word clone, it sounds like Hojo created them, when in reality, they just have Sephiroth cells injected into them, which in turn means they now have Genova cells inside of them. Five years later, now that Sephiroth has fully traveled the Lifestream and gained all powerful knowledge as well as fully combined himself with the power of Genova, as well as created a new body for himself encased in Mako inside of the Northern Crater, the same place where Genova crashed into the planet 2,000 years ago, Sephiroth begins to roll out his plan for ultimate planet destruction. His first move is to take control of the biggest source of Genova cells, Genova's actual remains, which have now been moved to Midgar. Genova's remains shift into Sephiroth's likeness, causing all of the characters to think that this is Sephiroth, when in reality, it is just a walking pile of Genova cells. You could still say that everything this character does is technically Sephiroth's doing, since he is the one controlling it. At any rate, Genova Roth breaks out of containment and rescues Cloud, since Sephiroth detects that he is one of the many Sephiroth clones that he can use to enact his grand scheme later. You ever notice how only Cloud's door is opened here? It's a really cool detail. Sephiroth knows that all living beings that have Genova cells in them, including Cloud, will be eventually called to join him at the Northern Crater. This is something that Hojo had already known about, and was partly the reason why he injected Sephiroth cells into Cloud and Zack in the first place. Genova Roth then climbs Shinra HQ and kills President Shinra. Genova Roth is finally shown to the player for the first time in the cargo ship on the way to Cosa del Sol. It flies away and leaves an arm behind, which transforms into the boss, Genova Birth. This part always perplexed me as a kid as well. I didn't understand how Sephiroth could just carry around something as big as Genova. But once the concept of Genova Roth was clear to me, it made a lot more sense. This is one of those things that couldn't really be accurately conveyed with what was available to the developers back then, but some type of cutscene where part of Genova Roth's body fell off and then mutated into the giant monster that the party fights would have been a really cool addition and would have cleared up a lot of confusion. The next time Genova Roth can be seen by the party is in the Shinra Manor basement, in an optional scene where Sephiroth continues to taunt Cloud about the reunion, throws a materia at him, and then flies away in what might be the goofiest out-of-context animation in the game. Then Genovaroth is found in the Temple of the Ancients, where it reveals Sephiroth's new plan to become a god. His plan, as stated before, is to absorb all of the lifestream energy of the planet, and to do so, he plans to use the ultimate destructive magic, Meteor. He tells the party that he will use the Black Materia, located in the temple, to summon Meteor and nearly destroy the planet. Then, when the planet attempts to fix itself with the power of the life stream, he will absorb it all and become the ultimate life form. It is a very popular trope for the villain to explain their entire evil plot even when it isn't warranted, but I think it works here as it seems his secret plan is to fool the party into collecting the black materia for him, which is enshrined in a puzzle which will cause the temple to collapse on whoever solves it. They decide to use Kate Sith to obtain the Black Materia as a way to protect it from Sephiroth, but Sephiroth already knows that Cloud will eventually reach him as the reunion is inevitable. Not only is Cloud destined to join Sephiroth later, 
but Sephiroth uses the influence he already has over the Genova cells within Cloud's body to hand over the Black Materia to Genova Roth as soon as he gets his hands on it. At this point, Aerith, the true last Cetra, travels to the City of the Ancients to summon the ultimate white magic, Holy, to counter the effects of Meteor. The party finds Aerith in the Ancient City, and Sephiroth uses his power over Cloud again to attempt to force him to kill her. When that fails, Genovaroth appears from above and finishes the job, impaling her. Genovaroth then taunts Cloud and then unleashes another Genova boss on the party, but Aerith had finished her prayer and succeeded in calling Holy. However, since Sephiroth had traveled the Lifestream and the very insides of the planet, he knew how to block Holy from escaping the core. The party tracks down Genovaroth within the North Crater and have a final fight with this version of Genova. They successfully kill Genovaroth and reclaim the Black Materia. Cloud entrusts the Materia to another party member due to his fears of Sephiroth controlling his mind again. Fears that are realized just moments later when Sephiroth transports Cloud and Tifa into an illusion of the past. In the illusion, Sephiroth tricks Cloud into thinking he is simply a creation of Genova cells with fake memories, instead of an actual person who is just injected with Genova cells after nearly dying. Cloud waves off the claims at first, but because Tifa can't remember Cloud ever being in Nibelheim, due to him being in a full set of armor at the time and Cloud's recollection being slightly wrong due to his memories being combined with Zack's, he begins to believe Sephiroth's lie and his fragile mind breaks. Now, at the full mercy of Sephiroth, Cloud is mind controlled to give over the Black Materia, and the true Sephiroth uses it to summon Meteor. During the chaos, the planet summons the weapons in order to protect itself, but in doing so causes Sephiroth's Mako-encased body to fall even deeper into the planet, putting him even closer to Holy and the Lifestream. In addition, Sephiroth creates an energy barrier blocking access to the crater, giving the weapons no choice but to attack Mako reactors to try to stop the weakening of the planet. And there's also whatever in the World Emerald and Ruby weapon we're doing. At this point, Sephiroth begins to transform his body into a godly form, awaiting the arrival of Meteor to enact his master plan. However, the Shinra fire their sister ray at the northern crater, destroying Sephiroth's barrier and allowing Cloud's party to delve into the depths and confront him. Protecting his true body in the core of the planet is a final form of Genova, Genova Synthesis. I don't think it is ever confirmed what this form of Genova is. Genova Roth was destroyed, meaning that Genova's actual corpse is gone. But my guess is that this Genova is a combination of all the remaining Genova cells from all of the failed Sephiroth clones, specifically the ones we see jumping into the crater during the party's initial visit there. After the party defeats her, they descend into the planet's core, where Sephiroth is waiting, appearing to the party in his original form. I'm not really sure why he would do this, but I feel like this was just a creative decision, as this is the image the party has been chasing the entire game. Sephiroth has reached supreme power at this point. He hasn't absorbed the full lifestream yet, but he has been powering up this entire time through the Mako in the North Crater in any lifestream he could find near the core of the planet. I mean, he was so strong at the beginning of the game that he was able to control and manipulate Genova from across the planet, and it has been weeks since then. But the party perseveres, seeing the power of Holy just before them and trusting in Aerith's power from within the planet, they take on Sephiroth, first defeating his bizarro form, then fighting his safer form. The safer form is seemingly the god form he was hoping to fully realize once Meteor hit. Cloud and the party defeat him, and it seems this time Sephiroth finally dissolves into the Lifestream. After the battle, Cloud himself has one final battle with Sephiroth, although this fight is more of a psychological battle within Cloud's mind. You could say that this entire scene isn't real, it's just a representation of Cloud finally removing Sephiroth completely from his mind, or you could say he literally enters his own mind and has a metaphysical battle with the remains of Sephiroth within himself. Either way, he omni-slashes Sephiroth into oblivion, escapes the crater, and with Sephiroth gone, Holy and Aerith are free to work together to save the planet from Meteor. Of course, 
Sephiroth never dies, though. And as it is explained in On the Way to a Smile, Lifestream Black, Sephiroth focuses on his hatred of Cloud to resist being dissolved into the Lifestream completely. When the Lifestream is spread across the surface of the planet to help repel Meteor, Sephiroth uses the opportunity to spread his gene into anybody the Lifestream comes in contact with, which creates the disease known as Geostigma. Geostigma is described as the body trying to repel the Sephiroth gene, but it overcompensates as it can't remove the infection. It is a little unclear how Geostigma actually works. It is explained that anybody who came into contact with the Tainted Lifestream contracted the virus, but it is also explained in the novel that Sephiroth specifically targets weak spirits, which creates despair and therefore more possible targets. So I think the way it works is that if you were touched by the original wave of Tainted Lifestream, you have contracted the gene, but the gene itself is only activated through your despair, which is why the people in the Advent Children movie think that the disease is contagious, because it continues to spread as more people lose hope and fall into despair. This also fits really well with Cloud's story in the movie, as his geostigma seems to grow as he continues to despair more and more about Aerith's death. Sephiroth isn't just content with the virus, though, as he creates the remnants of Sephiroth, Kadaj, Laz, and Yazu, who are basically physical manifestations of Sephiroth's will from within the livestream. Their goal throughout the movie is to resurrect Sephiroth's physical form by locating Genova's remains and creating a new body for him although they aren't told by Sephiroth their true goal and instead believe Genova is their mother and are simply looking for her to be reunited. At the beginning of the movie, Rufus orders the Turks to travel back to the North Crater and retrieve Genova's remains. Which, okay, not sure how Genova's remains are still intact and how in the world the Turks found them, but I guess we'll let that slide. Near the end of the movie, Kadaj retrieves the remains and absorbs them into his body, which gives Sephiroth full control of him, just as Sephiroth had control over Genovaroth in the original game, so he shapeshifts Kadaj's body into his likeness. Cloud and Sephiroth fight, and Sephiroth explains that his plan is to use all of the victims of Geostigma to basically take control of the Lifestream and gain control of the entire planet. He then plans to drive the planet through space to take control of other planets. Sounds pretty familiar, doesn't it? Cloud at this point has come to terms with Aerith's death, defeating his despair and therefore his geostigma, so he has the power to defeat Sephiroth, who with his final breath says, I will never be a memory. Now it is time to talk about Sephiroth's gameplay. So first, we will talk about Sephiroth as a party member during the Nibelheim flashback, and then we'll talk about him as an enemy. During the flashback, Sephiroth is a party member along with young Cloud, and he has been given special scripts both to make him look super strong, and also to make sure the player cannot game over during the flashback. This is actually a really important detail, as the developers of the original PC port of the game didn't program the game with a death in the flashback in mind, and 16 years later Glitch Hunters would find a way to game over in the flashback and completely break the game's code resulting in a wrong warp into the game's debug room. Sephiroth has special code that causes him to take no damage and be completely immune to all status ailments. Sephiroth also always hits and always crits. He is equipped with the Mazamune Sword, whose name is derived from the legendary medieval Japanese swordsmith and is a ridiculously long Odachi blade that is often shown as slightly longer than Sephiroth is tall meaning it is probably approaching 8 feet in length. It is said that he is the only person who can wield it, which is also shown to the player when Tifa attempts to use it on him and fails. He also has a gold armlet and a tough ring. Hmm. I wonder why they didn't give him one of the Shinra brand armors. He also has Materia, a Mastered Revive and Restore, Earth with All, Ice with All, Lightning with All, and Alone Fire Materia. He is level 50, which does enough to show his power as the regular party members at this time are around 15, but his stats are actually pretty comparable to another party member if they were level 50, albeit with a really high strength stat. 
Obviously, his complete immunity and auto crits make him look far more powerful than a regular party member though. The player has no control over Sephiroth during the flashback, and he instead follows a very strict AI. If there is a single enemy and he is within Sephiroth's range, Sephiroth will use a physical attack. If there is a single enemy but they are out of range, he will use Fire 3. One interesting note about Fire 3, you will actually never see Sephiroth use it while playing the game normally, as there is no single enemy out of range in any of the fights during the flashback. Interestingly, there is a zoo fight in Nibelheim on the bridge that would cause Sephiroth to use Fire 3, but it was removed during the flashback. This fight may be the reason that they coded Fire 3 in, but then later in development, they decided to remove the zoo fight from the flashback. If there is a group of enemies, he will use Quake 3, Ice 3, or Bolt 3, and if there are a group of enemies but one of them are out of reach or flying, he will use Ice 3 or Bolt 3, since Quake would miss. He never uses his Restore Materia, but if Cloud does die, he has a one-third chance of reviving him. All of Sephiroth's attacks are actually done through the AI script, so if you hack the game and remove his Materia, he'll still be able to use all of them. In addition, none of them take any MP away when he uses them. In fact, even if you heal Cloud in the menu, it still doesn't take any MP. Sephiroth has no limit and can't gain limit bar, but even if he could, he never takes damage, so it would never fill up anyway. Sephiroth can be hacked into the main party with a save editor, and you will keep his AI code and still be completely invincible. He also completely replaces Vincent, because in order to save on memory, the programmers decided to use the same slot of memory for Kate Sith and Young Cloud and Vincent and Sephiroth. This means he will also inherit all of Vincent's stats and equipment. There is a way to disable Sephiroth's AI script, which will make him vulnerable, as well as give the player the ability to control him. In order to do this, the player needs to set his HP to zero using the save editor, then revive him during battle. Since the AI is disabled, the player can use attacks with Sephiroth that he has no animation for, causing his model to break. I also wanted to quickly mention that there are only two things in the game that can survive Kate Sith's Death Joker and Game Over attacks. Ruby Weapon if his tentacles aren't in the ground, and Sephiroth if his immunity is on. Now let's talk Sephiroth as an enemy, and first up is Bizarro Sephiroth. Bizarro Sephiroth is probably the most interesting and complicated fight in the game, consisting of three different versions of the fight depending on the power level of the party. If the party, either, has an average party level of 53 or less, not including Aerith, has a party member level 34 or lower, not including Aerith, or took 13 or more turns to push Genova Synthesis into her countdown phase, Bizarro Sephiroth will be a single party fight. If the party doesn't reach any of the one party requirements, and they meet one of these requirements, the fight will be a two party fight, where the player must switch between the two groups during the fight. If the party meets all of these requirements, the fight will be a three-party fight, where every single party member gets to be utilized and the player must swap between all three groups. The three separate versions of the fight are quite different, but the general path to victory is the same. Sephiroth has five parts, the head, the left and right magics, which are the arms, the body, and the core. The head and magics have their own health bars and don't actually get turns. Instead, if they are alive, they open up new attacks that the body can use. If they die, they will automatically revive after a few turns. The head opens up an attack for the body called Stigma, which hits all party members and has a 100% chance to slow and poison, and Sephiroth's Shock, which is just a physical attack. The left magic enables Fire 3 and Quake 3, and the right magic enables Ice 3 and Bolt 3. In addition, the magics absorb the elements that they enable. If the head is dead, a new move is enabled for the body as well, called Aurora Fence, which is probably one of the strangest attacks in the game, and most players who have played through the game still have no idea what it does. Aurora Fence targets the entire party, but will always say Miss. If a party member is dead, it will instead revive them with a small amount of HP. So what's the deal? Why does it always miss, and why does it revive KO'd members, even though it's supposed to be an attack? Well, what Aurora Fence actually does is it removes every status ailment in the game. 
almost like a super dispel. Any negative and any positive ailments are removed, and I guess the developers thought this should even include the ailment of death, so it also revives dead party members. The miss that pops up is simply denoting that the revive part of the spell missed. This attack tends to be more positive than negative for the party, and some fans suspect that the spell is actually supposed to be used on Bizarro himself and not the party. If the core is dead, but the head is alive, one final attack is enabled for the body, Heartless Angel, which will reduce the entire party's HP to 1. The core is invincible unless both magics are dead, and all it does is heal the body for 6,000-ish HP every turn. To actually win the fight, the body needs to be killed, so the main idea of the fight is to kill the magics, then kill the core when it's vulnerable, and then finally kill the body. However, if the party has enough damage to mitigate the 6,000 HP a turn heal from the core, they can just simply burst down the body in any of the three scenarios and completely ignore all the gimmicks of the fight. In the two-party fight, each party has a separate head and a separate core that they need to kill, each protected by a single magic. The core on the right side needs to be destroyed first before the core on Cloud's side can be destroyed and stop the healing on the body. In addition, the left magic loses its Earth ability and instead casts and absorbs Fire 3 and Demi 3, and both magics gain status ailment spells. Only the Cloud Party can target and kill the body. The three party fight. <sighs> it's kind of a mess. There are three core parts and three head parts. The middle party has two magics, but the side parties only have one magic apiece. The core on both flanks must be destroyed before the core in the middle can be damaged. The magics are back to the original setup, where the left magic absorbs and casts fire and earth, and the right absorbs and casts ice and lightning. However, due to a mistake in the code, in the central fight, both magics will only absorb ice and lightning. Also, every time the head is defeated, Demi-3 is automatically cast on the party member that killed it. Only the center party with Cloud in it can target and kill the body. Bizarro Sephiroth's stats will also change depending on a number of factors, including how many characters in the party are level 99, and whether or not Knights of the Round was used on Genova Synthesis. This fight is really cool in theory, but unfortunately is quite the mess in any scenario other than the single party fight. The fight would be a lot easier to understand if the body parts had any type of visual representation when they're killed and revived. The multi-party fights feel complicated because visually, Bizarro himself only has the one head, two arms, and a core, but you have to basically imagine him having multiple heads, arms, and cores that all die and revive separately, but somehow only one body. The fight can also be really difficult to follow due to Bizarro's really long and drawn-out animations that slow the fight considerably. In addition, the party can only switch to other groups every time a part is destroyed, and the fight always starts on Cloud's party, which is the only party you don't want to start as if you're doing the fight correctly. And one final issue with this fight, it is one of the most common fights in the game to fall victim to the Quadra Magic Ultima glitch, which is a glitch in the game where if Ultima is linked with Quadra Magic and HP or MP Absorb, and cast on an enemy with too many targets, the game runs out of memory to hold all of the damage calculations and soft locks. When Bizarro is defeated, the party is immediately sent into the Safer Sephiroth fight. Safer Sephiroth follows an 8 turn cycle, and always sticks to this cycle, meaning an experienced player will always know his next move. The first attack alternates between Wall and Dispel, starting with Wall, but will always be Dispel if Sephiroth has slow status. His second attack is Shadow Flare, or if Safer used Dispel on the previous turn, Dean. Shadow Flare is an extremely powerful non-elemental magic attack, and is also a learnable enemy skill, and Dean is a weaker non-elemental magic attack, but it hits the entire party. His third attack is a physical attack on one target. On his fourth turn, he will raise up into the air, becoming a long-range target. His fifth attack is Pale Horse, a single-target non-elemental magic attack that also inflicts Frog, Sadness, and Small. His sixth attack is Supernova, a two-minute long non-elemental attack that deals 93.75% of the party's current HP and can inflict Confuse, Silence, and Slow. 
Funnily enough, this means that the party cannot actually die to Supernova, since it only deals percentage damage. Although, if not prepared, they can easily die soon after. The attack depicts a comet destroying multiple planets in the solar system before flying into the sun, creating an explosion that consumes the rest of the planets and finally the party. Supernova is 100% canon, meaning if you didn't defeat Safer Sephiroth before he used this attack, your playthrough doesn't count and you'll have to go play the game again. Sephiroth's seventh attack is Break, if his HP is above 25%, and Heartless Angel, if it's under 25%. And for his final turn, Sephiroth will drop back down, resetting the cycle. In the original Japanese version of the game, Safer Sephiroth's cycle is quite a bit different. Instead of using Wall, he uses Slow. Instead of Shadow Flare, he uses Regular Flare. Instead of Heartless Angel, he uses Doom. Pale Horse deals percentage damage instead of regular damage. And Supernova deals normal damage instead of percentage damage, and is a much shorter animation. That means that in this version, Supernova can actually kill the party, although it isn't as strong as you might think, and only deals about 2,000-ish damage to a normal party. Safer Sephiroth receives similar buffs to Bizarro Sephiroth depending on your previous fights, but are a bit more dramatic, receiving not only an HP buff, but stat buffs as well for every character at level 99, plus a whopping 80,000 max HP if Knights of the Round was used on Genova Synthesis. Safer also loses 100 HP for every time the party killed Bizarro Sephiroth's head, up to a max of 24,900 less HP. Finally, let's talk briefly about the final Sephiroth fight. This fight is hard-coded to be impossible to lose. If Cloud doesn't act in time for Sephiroth's turn, Sephiroth will hit Cloud for 96% of his health, and then Cloud will counterattack and the fight will end. Cloud isn't actually given any counterattack materia for this fight, Instead, Sephiroth's AI is what causes Cloud to counterattack. Sephiroth himself has 1 HP and 0 in every stat other than Dexterity. He is also level 50, just like his flashback counterpart. Sephiroth has three musical themes in the original Final Fantasy VII. His main theme is entitled, Those Chosen by the Planet, and plays during most of his appearances. He also has two boss themes. Birth of a God, which plays during the Bizarro fight, and One-Winged Angel, which plays during the Safer fight. One-Winged Angel in particular has been etched into the history of video game culture as one of the most iconic battle themes of all time, and over the years has become more of a theme than Sephiroth's actual theme. It has been rearranged an incredible amount of times for many different Final Fantasy projects and even projects outside of Final Fantasy. One Winged Angel was also the first song in the franchise to include lyrics, which are all chanted in Latin. If you ever wanted to know what the lyrics mean, here is an unofficial English translation. Nobuo Umatsu has said that One Winged Angel was meant to be an experimental song, both in sound and in structure, and that his goal is to create something new and something unique from the other battle themes he had made in the past games. He wanted the song to sound like a 60s or 70s rock song, but be performed by a full orchestra, and he took inspiration from Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho theme, as well as Russian composer Igor Stravinsky and rock musician Jimi Hendrix. Sephiroth's name has an incredibly interesting source. As mentioned in my Aerith in-depth video, both Aerith and Tifa's names were inspired by the Jewish Tree of Life, in which ten different manifestations of God are described as ways to allow him to connect to us in a physical and metaphysical way. These ten manifestations are called the Ten Sephira, and as a whole are called the Sephirot. Sephiroth is also connected to the Seraph, an angel with six wings, and the fallen angel, Abazethabu, I bet you it's Abazethabu, who had a single red wing to symbolize his betrayal of God and his fall from grace. It is a common belief that the name Safer Sephiroth could have also been translated as Seraph Sephiroth. Some of his attacks in the final battle are also Jewish references, including Dean and Pale Horse. One really cool detail is that Sephiroth always uses Supernova directly after using Pale Horse, and the term Pale Horse refers to the horse ridden by death, the fourth and final horseman of the apocalypse. Sephiroth was designed by Tetsuya Nomura, whose original concept was for a main villain that would be chased throughout the entire story. 
His fights with Cloud were inspired by the great clash of Sasaki Kajiro and Miyamoto Musashi. Sasaki wielded a long nodachi blade named Monohoshizao, which may have been another inspiration for the Mazamune. Sephiroth's long hair, though difficult to create on the PS1 engine, was vital in showing contrast with the main protagonist, Cloud. His hair also resembles Aerith's hair, as during development the team experimented with the two being brother and sister, and at one point even lovers. Another way they designed Sephiroth to be the antithesis of Cloud was to make him left-handed. It isn't super apparent when playing the original game that Sephiroth is left-handed, both because his in-game model loves to hold his sword in his right hand, and because his fighting stance, which is a well-known Japanese sword stance used in ninjutsu, places his right hand very close to his left. Sephiroth is one of the biggest recurring characters in the Final Fantasy franchise, appearing in many Final Fantasy games as well as the Kingdom Hearts series. In the original Kingdom Hearts, Sephiroth is voiced by Lance Bass, the same Lance Bass from the 90s boy band in Sync. Sephiroth can also be seen in games outside of the Final Fantasy franchise, and was added to the Super Smash Bros. Ultimate roster in 2020. He also, of course, reappears in the Final Fantasy VII Remake, but seems to have a different aura about him. We'll just leave it at that for now, until the remake is completed. If you were to look up the top villains list on almost any website, there is a very good chance that Sephiroth ranks very highly on that list and for good reason. In the original game, he was masterfully crafted as a dynamic force whose power, motives, and eventual turn on humanity is shown in real time to the player. He follows the party through their entire journey, and all of the work put into his character is all paid off in one of the grandest finales in video game history. He has a great setup and a great payoff, but there's more to him than that as he has transcended into the public consciousness as an icon of the bad guy. When a character designer looks to create an antagonist, Sephiroth is one of the many default examples he could use. Although in the game he is actually an extremely deep and complicated character, on the outside he just oozes all of the qualities of the baddest guy in the room. But in the end, he isn't just a bad guy. He is a tragic villain, a fallen soldier, the one-winged angel. Thank you for watching this in-depth look at Sephiroth. I wanted to take a moment just to talk about the future of the in-depth looks. So if you were just here to watch a video about Sephiroth, Thank you very much for watching, and I hope to see you in the next in-depth look. But for those of you that are a bit more invested in the series as a whole, I just wanted to update you on a few things. So up to this point, we have looked at every playable character in Final Fantasy VII and Sephiroth, except Cloud. So Cloud is definitely going to be the next in-depth look. But you might be asking, what comes after that? Well, ever since the beginning of In-Depth Look, I've always wanted to expand out into other characters that I love, including other characters from other Final Fantasy games, as well as just characters from other games in general. But, as a lot of you guys have pointed out, there are still other characters in Final Fantasy VII that I would like to cover as well, like the Turks and Zack. So moving forward, I want to cover all of those bases. I want to talk about more Final Fantasy VII characters, but I want to go a bit out of my comfort zone and talk more about other Final Fantasy characters and just really big, influential, important video game characters in general. So as the series continues, I want to enlist your guys' help to decide what characters we should look at next. So when you go down to comment on this video, go ahead and leave whatever comment you are already going to leave, and then below that, I'd like you to list three specific characters. The first one, I want you to list another Final Fantasy VII character that you'd like to see me cover in the future. For two, I'd like you to pick any Final Fantasy character you'd like to see me cover. And for three, I'd like you to go crazy and just pick any character from any video game that you would like to see an in-depth look on. Also, up to this point, I've been keeping it a secret which character I was doing an in-depth look on until the video released. But for now on, I'm going to be involving a lot more of the community on these projects. On Patreon, I'll be running polls with all of the characters that you guys list in the comments that will directly influence which character gets an in-depth look next. 
and I'll also be posting a lot of updates about the project as it goes on. I'll also be setting up a place in the Discord where people can drop information and fun facts about whichever character I'm currently working on. So if you're interested in any of that, I'll drop the Patreon and Discord links down below, but please don't feel pressured to join if you don't want to. Again, I want to thank my big patrons as well as you for watching the video and sharing it, subscribing, whatever you do to support it. And I look forward to reading all of those comments about which characters you guys want to see. And I'll see you in the next in-depth look.